Welcome to Kids Considered, where two pediatricians discuss children's health topics of interest to parents in a podcast with new subjects considered every episode. I'm Dr. Lena Vanderlist. And I'm Dr. Dean Blumberg. And we're both pediatricians at UC Davis Children's Hospital in Sacramento, California. Let's hear about this episode's topic. Hi, my name's Violet. I'm 17 years old, and I just learned how to drive and have recently started driving on the road. The parents are pretty strict about who I can drive with or when I can drive. And I was wondering if this is a natural concern um, and if teens actually are at a higher risk for accidents because that's always their reasoning for having me avoid being behind the wheel. Oh, man, that's a tricky one. It is, because we do worry about teens driving, and we really want them to drive safely. You can't really can't underestimate the importance of driving safely, right? Right, of course. I mean, it's really a matter of life and death at times. It is, it is. And car crashes are the leading cause of death for teens and young adults. More than 5,000 young people die every year in car crashes in the United States alone, and thousands more on top of that are injured. So parents are appropriately concerned about teens driving. Right. So I've heard that teens aren't as interested in driving as much as when I was a kid. What kind of car did you have? An old one, probably. I did have an old one, but it was like a a Ford LTD or something. That's not that exciting. No, yeah, I'm not that old. (laughs) (laughs) I'm just kidding. But it is true that getting a driver's license used to be a rite of passage. Teens would want it. On their 16th birthday. Right. On their 16th birthday, they would go to the Department of Motor Vehicles and get it. And it was a real milestone of independence because they could drive anywhere and then they don't have to depend on their parents so much. Right. But nowadays, teens are less interested in driving. There's the cost that's associated with driving, gas, Mm -hmm. insurance, the cars themselves, plus traffic. Traffic's worse, for sure. Right. And for many teens, there's just more affordable and more convenient transportation options like... Riding their bike or their skateboard or Uber or Lyft, some of these rideshare companies. And interestingly, there's also been some studies that have shown that the higher proportion of Internet users, the lower the rates of licensed drivers. Over the past 30 years, there's been almost a 50 percent decrease in the percentage of 16-year-olds with a license. Some teens are just waiting until they're older to get a license. But even in 19-year-olds, more than 20 percent are less likely to have a driver's license compared to 30 years ago. So even so, the majority of teens will end up driving, so it's important to address how parents can do their best to help their children be the safest drivers they can be. Yes. But before we do that, let's take a really deep dive into the teenage brain. Oh my God, that sounds really scary. (laughs) (laughs) It is scary because teens may not have developed some of those important developmental features that they need to drive safely. I usually think of developmental issues in younger children, not teens. So what are those those issues in teens? Well, like motor coordination. Think of it how how hard it is to coordinate your eyes and your hands and your feet. I mean, easier now that we have automatic transmission, transmission, Uh but still requires some coordination. Right. And we all know that um, teens' judgment may not be the best. Part of this is lack of experience. They haven't ever merged onto the highway before. Mm -hmm. They could misjudge timing. Yeah. And teens are also more easily distracted than older drivers. This means they're more likely to drive too fast or tailgate or text or otherwise not concentrate on the road. And we should also talk about sex. Um, I think the safe sex podcast will have to be saved for another time. Well, not teens having sex. I mean, sex differences in driving. Oh, I see. The differences between boys and girls driving. Absolutely. So in general, males are more likely to overestimate their abilities, maybe in more realms than just driving. And um, they're more likely to submit to peer pressure and have emotional mood swings. And all these may lead to crashes. Does the data support that increased voice? Because it seems a little sexist. Because I myself, as a teen, experienced all of those things that you just mentioned. Well, I think it's true. But yeah, it's, there is data that supports that, that male drivers are at increased risk for car crashes than female drivers. Gotcha. Mm-hmm. And that's why all of these things that we talked about, the mood swings, the peer pressure, the overestimating their abilities, is why teen drivers disproportionately account for motor vehicle injury costs by over 50%. Mm -hmm. So teen drivers between 16 to 19 years of age are almost three times as likely 
to be in a fatal crash compared to drivers 20 years of age and older. Wow, those are really sobering statistics. Mm -hmm. So what can parents do to keep their teens safe? So experience matters. So extra practice driving really helps. Right. Practice makes perfect or close to perfect when driving. (laughs) Right. So many school or private driver's education courses provide only six hours of total on-the-road driver's training. And we know that it takes about 50 hours to be a reasonably capable driver. So parents can accompany their child driving so that they can get this valuable experience. Right. And first the teen passes the visual test and then the written exam, and that gets them to the learner's permit. And then the parent can help teach them good driving skills. Starting off with the basics, starting, stopping around the streets where they live, maybe in a parking lot, then move on to driving at night on freeways, in the rain or snow and traffic. You can work with your teen's driving instructor to make sure you're on the same page. An easy way to do this is to try to incorporate this into your usual routine. So let your teen drive the car when you're going with them to the store or on other errands. So we've been talking about this like it's a simple task. Mm -hmm. Like all parents need to do is just get in the car with their teenager and go. But not so simple. Yeah, so we, we want them to do this, but yeah, you, I see what you mean. It's just not so simple. It can be so stressful for both the parent and the teen. Some of the biggest arguments I've ever had with my dad were in this very scenario. Oh, really? Yes, I, I, because it's just high stress for both of you. Uh-huh. Now, as I'm getting older, I imagine how difficult it is for a parent. Yeah, it was stressful for my father and I, too, (laughs) in that situation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what can parents do so that driving lessons go more smoothly and it's less stressful for both the parent and the teen? Well, it's good to plan ahead and have shared expectations. So before driving anywhere, make sure that you both know how you're getting there, because there's like a variety of ways you can go there, right? Right. Talk about which way you're going to be going and maybe for that drive, what skills you want to focus on. And so when you're giving instructions, try to do so very patiently and with a calm voice. If you're yelling at your teen or ordering your teen to do something, (laughs) Uh that's going to stress them out and it's going to be really hard to concentrate on driving. Yeah, but what happens if your teen makes a mistake? Then you need to like correct them, right? Right. So I would say at that point, ask to pull over and then calmly talk about what happened and how you would handle it next time. Mm -hmm. And then ask your teen to narrate your trip and to share what they're seeing um, on, you know, other cars or on the road, the traffic, just to talk about it as you're driving. And at the end of the trip, process together what went well and what could be improved upon. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. And always try to offer praise for some aspect of their driving. They need positive encouragement. Yeah. And log the hours you spend with your teen in the car. Because this is often needed to obtain an unrestricted license. And try your best to be patient. Now when my dad rides with me, he takes full credit for how good of a driver I am. So (laughs) think about that one day. You'll be able to do that as well. Uh There you go. Yeah, you got (laughs) to think of the long game. Yeah. (laughs) So let's talk about graduated licenses. Yes, let's. So I keep hearing about graduated licenses, but they weren't around when I was a teen. So you just got your driver's license when you were 16 and then you were good to go? Yeah, we went to driver's ed and then we got our driver's license, passed the test, got our license, and then you can like drive anytime, anywhere. Mm -hmm. (laughs) With anyone in the car? With anyone in the car, yeah. Interesting. Well, I think we've learned a lot since then. In (laughs) fact, the American Academy of Pediatrics recommends that teens should not receive an unrestricted driver's license until they're 18 years old, or they've been driving with adult supervision for two years. Mm Mm-hmm. So what are the usual restrictions under a graduated driver's license? So the first phase, the teen driver is a learner. So they're with an adult when they're driving. They're being supervised. Mm -hmm. So this is like a learning permit. permit. Yeah. So this is before they even get a license. Right. Then there's the second phase. It's probationary or intermediate. Mm -hmm. Teens can drive alone, but under restricted conditions, such as like not driving late at night. And so this limits their exposure to high-risk situations because late at night it's dark and they might get be tired or something. And they're more likely to be like out drinking or something mm, like that. Mm-hmm. The third phase would allow for teens to drive alone without restrictions. And then after this, they get their full license. Right. Mm-hmm. We've been talking about the graduated driving programs in very general terms because they vary state by state. So, for example, some states may restrict driving after sunset. For others, the cutoff is 6 p.m., 9 p.m., or even midnight. Mm -hmm. 
And is there evidence that these graduated driver's license programs work? Right. Yeah, there is. The more comprehensive the graduated medical license programs, the more reduced the risk of fatal crashes and overall crashes among 16-year-olds. Yeah, so that makes a lot of sense. And so if you're in a state that doesn't have one of these graduated license programs, you might want to consider advocating for that. You might want to move. <laughs> or if you like where you're living, just get the law changed, right? So this provides um, really these comprehensive graduated driver's license programs, provides new drivers with more supervised practice and experience. And these are under lower risk conditions during the daytime and also without others in the car. So there's less peer pressure. All right. We should talk more about why these graduated license programs work. So we talked about that restricting driving at night just is common sense, right? Yeah. First, there's less visibility. And second, teens may be more tired at night, so they're less alert. Mm -hmm. And then what about restricting driving to driving alone or with adults? Right. Accidents are more common when teen drivers have other teens in the car. And we'll talk about this in more detail when we discuss some other safety rules. What about states that don't have these graduated license programs? What can parents do to get their teens to drive more safely? Well, parents are in charge, so they can set up their own graduated driver's license program. They can set their own rules. So depending on your comfort with how your teen is driving, then you can set the limits on nighttime driving and driving with other teens in the car. And then expand these driving privileges at the right pace for your particular teen, how they're driving and how they're doing. There are other safety rules we should also talk about. Right. So an obvious one is always wear a seatbelt. Not wearing a seatbelt triples the chance of injury in a serious crash. No texting or talking on the phone. And be careful when you're using like a GPS for directions. It's better to pull off the road to check these. No driving or riding with anyone else under the influence of alcohol, drugs, or marijuana. Drivers with the active ingredient of marijuana, THC, in their blood are twice as likely to cause a fatal accident as those that do not have any in their blood. And for more information on marijuana, listeners can find our podcast on this. Mm -hmm. And no driving if impaired by emotions like being really angry or upset or sad. Or tired. It's also important to limit the number of friends in the car at one time. Mm -hmm. So more passengers in the car can be distracting and increases the risk of a car crash. Adding one passenger increases the risk of the crash by 40%. Two passengers will double the risk and three almost quadruples the risk of being in a car accident. Wow. So start off with no more than one friend at a time in the car if they are allowed by their license. Then you can gradually increase the number of passengers. No eating or drinking while driving because these activities can also be distracting. And music should be at a low or moderate volume, not turned all the way up. Right, and no fiddling with phones or radios or MP3 players. Just, nobody has MP3 players Oh, anymore. they don't? Well, I, I was, that, at least I didn't mention like cassettes or eight tracks, right? <laughs> <laughs> Try to avoid nighttime driving at first. Teens are four times more likely to die in a car crash at night than during the day. And you may want to limit distance of driving also, or at least have your teen ask permission for long trips. And no picking up hitchhikers. You really rarely ever see hitchhikers anymore, but they also shouldn't hitchhike themselves. Although, as a digression, I was just talking to somebody who was um, all doing a lot of travel, worldwide travel, and she says hitchhiking is still common in, in Europe. In other places? In other places, yeah. So it's really still common. All and right. in the U.S., not very common. Not no. very common. Mm -hmm. Don't pick up hitchhikers and don't hitchhike yourself. No, you don't want your teen to be in a vulnerable situation in a car with a stranger. So it's a lot of rules. What happens when your teen inevitably <laughs> breaks some of the rules? So there has to be some sort of penalty. There have to be consequences, right? right. That's why there is a rule. Right. So for minor issues, a warning system might be appropriate. Mm -hmm. And for something that's more serious that really puts them at risk, then maybe a timeout from driving, no driving for a period of time. Discipline can be challenging. But parents have the responsibility to teach their children to drive safely. Some parents might find it useful to have all the rules spelled out in a document that's been reviewed by both you as the parent and the teen so that there's no misunderstandings about what the rules are. So we have a link on our website of an example contract, a um, parent-teen driving agreement, if parents want to take a look at that. And they can modify these for their own situation. Great. 
We've been talking a lot about driving, but let's also talk about cars. Okay, so I drive a Prius, and you drive a RAV4, right? I drive a RAV4, yeah, yep. yeah. 2007. It's yeah. getting old. Uh-huh. <laughs> but I really meant to say that we want to make sure that your child is driving a safe car. Absolutely. We want it to be safe. We don't want to compromise on that at all. Mm-hmm. So we know it might be more expensive, but your child's safety is worth it to have a new or late model car with all the new modern safety features. So mid-size or full-size cars are best. They provide more crash protection than small compact cars. Right. And we're not saying that you go need to go out and buy your teen this car. Teens are actually less likely to speed in a family vehicle than their own. So if you already have an appropriate family vehicle, mm-hmm. you should start with that. Right, rather than getting them a new car. Mm -hmm. And of course, you want airbags and available safety features such as the blind spot warning, automatic braking, lane assist, and a backup camera. That's when I bought my car. I said, I want all those features. (laughs) I have none of those features, but my blind spot is horrible. Is that? Yeah. Oh, I love that little flashing yellow light on the side view mirrors that tell me if it's, you know, don't change lanes. One of the first gifts my husband back then we were dating Mm -hmm. bought me Mm-hmm. was those little little mirrors you put oh, on your the, rear the, the, the view. convex ones. Yeah, so that you can see your blind spot. Uh-huh. And I remember being like, this is the present. He's like, I have a present. And I was oh, like, but that's beautiful. That's what my dad said. He's like, that's a keeper. He, he cares about your safety. I know. Yeah, I know. that's but very nice. I know. Where mm-hmm. were we here? So we were um, <laughs> talking about, about all these nice safety features. And there are also other features like smart key fobs that limit speed. And they can block some electronic distractions like turning off all cell phone notifications while you're driving. I think the cell phones is a really big one for teens. So mm-hmm. like put it in your backpack in the backseat of the car and just... Ignore it because that is a huge distraction that Mm -hmm. you need to minimize. Mm -hmm. Some insurance companies might provide devices for in-vehicle monitoring for teen drivers. And there are some smartphone apps that monitor teen drivers for speeding and um, also provide warnings. So you want to take advantage of the latest technology while also not completely spying on your teenager and having some trust. (laughs) That might might be difficult, yeah. Right. And avoid dumping like a beater car on your child because they're just not as safe as newer model cars. We should also mention some common sense car issues that parents should show their children. Mm -hmm. So it's important to like tell them how to wash the car, right? (laughs) I was thinking more about car maintenance. Uh Uh-huh, like changing the oil or something like that. Yeah, and even more basic than that, checking the tire pressure. This is a big one. Mm -hmm. Because that's a safety issue. It's a safety issue. And you actually legally... Gas stations have to, like, usually they'll charge, like, a quarter or something, but they have to turn it on. Every time I need air in my tires, I just go ask them to, to, to turn it on, and they'll mm-hmm. do it for you. So, right. That's a California law. Yeah, uh, but it might not be every state. Every, maybe not every state. So yeah. doing that with your kids, showing how to check air pressure, fluids, like the oil level, mm-hmm. windshield wiper fluids, and even how to change a flat tire. Yeah, or make sure that you're in a program that provides roadside assistance. And so there's auto clubs, some car manufacturers provide that when you buy a new car, and some um, car insurance, they have their own programs too. There's one more thing that parents can do to help their kids be safe drivers. What's that? They can be good role models behind the wheel. Of course, and really, like, always use their seatbelt. Don't use their cell phone. Follow all traffic laws and regulations. Be patient drivers. Do not drive aggressively. No weaving in and out of traffic. And absolutely no driving when impaired or drinking. All right. And always follow the speed limit. We absolutely know that it's important for parents to be involved with their kids. And parents need to set reasonable, consistent rules and expectations. That's a fact that if parents provide supervision and support, then crashes are half as likely compared to teens without involved parents. Great. So let's summarize some of the main points that we talked about with teen driving. So learning to drive is a process, and until teens gain skills and experience, they are at higher risk for accidents, injuries, and even death from car crashes. But as a parent, you can take an important and active role in teaching children to drive safely. And by being good role models for their children. Yep, you can gradually increase their driving privileges to allowing nighttime driving and then eventually driving with friends. That's why graduated driver's license programs are effective. Make sure your teen understands the rules of the road. And make sure that they are driving a safe car. And take advantage of the latest technology to make driving safer for teens. Mm -hmm. 
You know, that reminds me of something that uh, I heard from one of our friends, the kids. She said, Dad, how come when mom's driving, all the other drivers are effing bad? <laughs> <laughs> So mom's not not doing some really good role modeling well, in that case. Oh, uh, well, mom was a f- more aggressive driver than dad in that family. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, but I'd like to finish and summarize some of the main concerns and um, issues with a song. Yes, let's do it. Mm-hmm. I will say that Dr. Dean has gotten a little creative with these songs. Mm-hmm. I, I used a little poetic license. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So we'll see how it goes. Okay. My teenager is driving to school, driving to work, to practice so cool. They drive to a concert with their friends, or to the store on many errands. My baby returns from where they roam. My baby returns, they come on home. Return to me, return safely, return to me, return safely. Even if they drive afar, even driving to the stars, return to me, return safely, return to me, return safely. Driver's education and safe cars, state graduated license laws, no distractions like using cell phones, no accidents, avoid danger zones. My baby returns from where they roam. My baby returns, they come on home. Return to me, return safely. Return to me, return safely. Even if they drive afar, even driving to the stars. Return to me, return safely. Return to me, return safely. That wraps up this episode of Kids Considered. You can find more information on our website, kidsconsidered.ucdavis.edu. Follow us on Twitter at Kids Considered. And Instagram at Kids Considered. If you have feedback on this show or topics you would like us to discuss in the future, we would love to hear from you. Please call us. Our number is 916-915-3388. Or email us at kidsconsidered at gmail.com. Please rate us on iTunes or wherever you subscribe to your podcasts. Thank you for listening, and we hope you will join us for our next podcast. Kids Considered is sponsored by UC Davis Children's Hospital. 